There's power in her, too, isn't there? <laughs> I, she did that in the first service, and I said, if I had tried that in that first service, they would be calling 911. <laughs> and I don't think that's an exaggeration at all. Wow, thank you. Thank you for sharing that beautiful and powerful song with us today. Wonderful message. I, uh, I got to tell you, I'm a little suspicious about some of that those early morning people in that eight o'clock. I don't, I don't really think, I don't really think some of them are early morning people at all. <laughs> and I know I'm not, and I, I don't, uh, I don't belong in their world. They just let me in to visit once in a while. This is my crowd right here. <laughs> Amen. I feel right at home right now. I'm so glad that you're here today. God bless you. It's just great to see all of you on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, we left uh, the house this morning and the garage door wouldn't close. And I thought, oh, is that the kind of day this is going to be? <laughs> but then I, I wanted to put it all in perspective now. It could be worse because usually when that happens, it's a chill factor of 30 below outside. <laughs> So uh, we'll, we'll deal with that later, and we'll do it in, in beautiful weather. Well, let, uh, I want to talk to you today uh, knowing that my sermon is going to be a little like walking into a minefield. Uh, it will be misunderstood by some, but I feel so passionate about it. The truth is, if you told me I had one sermon left to preach... I wouldn't back down from this one. This is the one that I'd want to share with God's people. And hopefully this is not the last sermon I have to preach, but even if it's not, I'm smart enough to know I'm running out of time. And if there's a truth that burdens my heart, fills my heart, I really need to get it said. I really need to share it with the body of Christ. So having said that, let me just offer one disclaimer the opinions and views of this author do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of the New Hope Assembly of God, the Iowa District of the Assemblies of God, or the General Council of the Assemblies of God. <laughs> I'm being maybe just a little facetious there. Uh, I do believe that what I'm sharing with you today is truly biblical in the teaching of Scripture. Now, we know that the teaching of Scripture can be confused and compromised by men and churches and denominations and traditions. We have to always be aware of that and alert. Can it be that we have lost sight of one of the most precious truths of Scripture due to those very factors? Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1 takes us into our venture this morning of exegesis, exploration, and exhor exhortation. I'm going to read these words that many Christians listen to respectfully, nod approvingly, and claim to cherish, but do not put into practice. Many churches fear these words, and preachers shun them. It's all found in one verse, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. There, and here we go, chapter 5, verse 1, the Apostle Paul said, It is for freedom. Don't you love that word? Amen. I didn't get an amen with the word freedom. <laughs> Maybe I'm not in the right crowd. Let's try it again. Don't you love that word freedom? Yeah. Woo! Thank God for it. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And in verse 13, Paul reiterates, You, my brothers, were called to be free. Now, Jesus is a lot of things to us. Jesus is Savior and Lord. He's healer and forgiver of our sins. 
He's redeemer and provider. He's so many things. But one of the most important truths to remember is that He is our deliverer. He made that clear in what He said and in what He did. At the very beginning of His ministry, He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom, freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind to release the oppressed. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And in the next breath, he said, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Freedom. If we lose sight of that, we've forgotten one of the chief reasons why Jesus came into this world. We have forgotten one of heaven's sweetest gifts and earth's greatest joys in being a Christian. Hear the declaration again. Christ has set us free. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, free from what? Free from anything and everything. Free from anyone and everyone. Free from any and every yoke of slavery. Recently, Dennis, you know, the menace, was sitting in a chair in his oft-visited corner. His body is facing the corner, but his head is turned toward his mother, I assume, and he's saying, I thought the truth was supposed to set you free. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Now, I still believe it, but so often don't see it. Don't see Christians living in freedom. Don't see peace and joy and hope. Instead, I see a lot of guilt and fear and shame and condemnation and frustration and despair. Why the disconnect? Why the inability to enter into the promised land of Christian freedom? We'll get into that. But know this first. Christ came to set us free. Parenthetically, and I've been waiting all week to use that word, this this is not cheap grace we're talking about. This is not looking for an excuse to live selfishly or recklessly. No, love does not conduct itself that way. That's why Paul says what Paul says in chapter 5 and verse 13. You were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. So freedom doesn't supersede our love, and love doesn't sacrifice our freedom. This is freedom, and that freedom is a part of the Christian's heritage. It belongs to us. It is a gift Jesus gives us. He became a slave to the cross so that I would never have to be a slave again. Christ has set us free. Secondly, Paul says, Christ has set us free for freedom. Doesn't it say that right there in the text? Christ has set us free for freedom. Let's go to our second point there. So please don't miss this. Why did Jesus set us free? To be free. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. He set us free so we could be free, so we could enjoy the freedom that He gives. It is a great tragedy when Christ's followers do not live in Christ's freedom. And surely there are a number of reasons for that, but there are two that, that come to mind very quickly. And the first one is, one of the reasons we don't live in His freedom is because we fall prey to and we believe the lies of the devil. 
He is the accuser of the brethren. And he attacks us, whether we're young or old. Did you hear what the young girl said in the clip? She said she had struggled with the notion of that God was willing to forgive her. Now, why wouldn't God forgive her? What great sin does an eight-year-old commit or a nine-year-old? But even at that early age, she had the, the notion, she had to fight the battle to be able to receive the truth that God's forgiveness is immediately available to us. And one of the reasons we don't live in freedom is because we believe the lies of the devil, this accuser of the brethren who constantly bombards us with his lies and his accusations and his deceptions, who constantly harasses us and tells us that we're not good enough and we could never be good enough. He tells us we are unworthy and unlovable. Condemnation is his game, and we too often find ourselves playing his game. There's nothing holy about being a slave. There's nothing good about it. And I wonder how many Christians fall into the category Paul describes in chapter 5 when he addresses Christians who are trying to be justified by the law. And they have set themselves up, he says, for alienation from Christ in verse 4, being falling, uh, fallen away from grace and thrown into confusion in verse 10. That's not the work of God. That's not the work of grace. This is the work of Satan using his favorite tool against Christians, religion. And by the way, the absence of amens doesn't bother me. I'm used to it. <laughs> Another reason we fail to find this freedom is that the toxic belief systems, the bad theology that passes on from one person to another, sometimes from well-meaning people, but nevertheless carriers of dangerous distortions that threaten the peace and the joy and the freedom of believers. Too many of us live with notions we think make us holy. Like the more you go to church, the more spiritual you are. No, if only it were that easy. If only it were that easy. Or the more you give, the more God will bless you. Or the more you sacrifice, the better Christian you are. The more you pray the more gold stars you get. The more you look and talk and act like us, conformity, well, the better person you obviously are. And the list goes on and on and exhausting. It's, it's like a mouse on a treadmill. It becomes a competition based on rules and one-upmanship. The problem is they're our rules. They're not God's rules. They're our rules. They were formulated out of human pride, designed to put on display our holiness, designed to flaunt our righteousness, which the Bible declares is as filthy rags. You know, you can be proud over your station in life. You can be proud over your talent, your looks, your money, your education, your possessions, but the worst pride of all is religious pride. That's why the only people you ever see Jesus go after are the religious people. And the worst bondage of all is religious baggage and bondage. Jesus said, my yoke is easy, but the yoke of religion is, is hard. He said, my burden is light, but the burden of religion is heavy. So it's a great tragedy to see Christians forfeiting their freedom, but my, it's a great triumph to see them fulfilled in their freedom, to see them experiencing what Paul says belongs to them. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Here it is. It's yours. It belongs to you. Christ gives it to you. 
I found that freedom when I was 17 years old. 17. My 20 years goes by fast. Oh. And all oh, the peace and the joy, the freedom like I never knew existed. But then I met the church. Some Christians who literally feared freedom and would do anything to repress it. Freedom frightened them because they couldn't trust it. They didn't know how to handle it. They much preferred the boundaries of rules. Lots of rules. Freedom condemned them because of their lack of it. Legalist law lovers are never more uncomfortable than when they are around freedom. So you and I have to decide what's going to be the foundation of our walk with God. Is it going to be men and traditions and law and list and expectations of others? Is it going to be preachers and churches and denominations? Or will we dare live in the freedom for which Christ has set us free? I can tell you this. If it's freedom, it won't be popular but it will always be worth it. That leads us to Paul's third declaration. First, Christ has set us free. Secondly, Christ has set us free for freedom. And then thirdly, Christ has set us free for freedom. Now stand firm. Stand firm in that freedom. The reason you have to stand firm on freedom's foundation is because there will be people who will try to talk you off or pull you off, or push you off, or even knock you off. Some have made an art form and a science out of judging others and attacking their freedom. I've been in some churches, been the pastor of some, where it was against the church bylaws to smoke and drink and play cards and go to movies or any worldly amusement, which is pretty much everything, but you could, you, could, you could judge others all you wanted. And if you're like me, and I can only hope you're not, you've got enough problems of your own. <laughs> you've got enough projects there to keep you busy for 10 years. Make that 10 lifetimes. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed until some church people get a hold of you. <laughs> See, church can be a healthy place. It can be an unhealthy place. It can be a place of mercy or manipulation, inspiration or intimidation. Let me, sh let me share how it played out for me. Here's how it came down for me. When I was 17, as I said, this unchurched kid wept himself into the kingdom of God, and there was such a birthing. The joy was unbelievable. The peace was off the charts. The love irrepressible. And it sort of went like this. Welcome, young man, to the family of God. We're so glad to hear that Jesus has come into your life. He saved you, and he's given you his glorious freedom. And now we got a list for you. And by the way, it's never complete. We're always adding new things. And if you go to another group, they'll have their list too. Meet the joy robbers, the list holders, the morality police, the law enforcers. I think Chuck Swindoll called them grace killers. All it takes is one to make your day. In chapter 2 of Galatians, Paul calls them spies. He says they have infiltrated our ranks and spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus. Why? To make us slaves, he says. Slaves to their ideas and opinions and expectations. So here's the list. And uh, thankfully, I can say that I've not 
heard any of this in this church. Thankful for that. But here's just a partial list of things I have been told that I could not and should not do as a Christian. And by the way, I pretty much have done them all. You can't go to movies. You can't have a television. You can't have long hair if you're a guy and short hair if you aren't. You can't wear sideburns and beards. You go pretty much directly to hell. (laughs) Do not pass go. Even though Jesus wore a beard, you can't wear short-sleeved shirts. Don't ask me. You can't wear colored shirts on Sunday morning. You can't wear shorts anytime. Apparently someone had seen my legs. <laughs> Let's add that to the list. You can't wear jewelry of any kind. You can't have a Christmas tree. You can't play cards or a pool or go to a pool. You can't go to a restaurant that sells alcoholic beverages. Grocery stores, you're okay. (laughs) You can't drive sports cars or red cars, and a red sports car is another direct pass into perdition. (laughs) You can't get tattoos. You can't wear makeup. I went real light on that today. You can't wear jeans. No, 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 no. For some reason, some Christians are really hung up on denim. (laughs) And last but not least, you can drink all the pop you want, all the coffee you want. You can eat all the food you want. But if you allow one sip of wine to pass through your lips, you are the chief of sinners. But pastor... (laughs) Come on, pastor, we're supposed to hold each other accountable. It's all about accountability. Okay, my turn. I'm holding you accountable. Don't be intrusive and manipulative. Don't judge other people. M-Y-O-B. Work out your own salvation. Let them work out theirs. You say, well, you know, we call this holiness. But it's not. It's really a yoke. I didn't say joke. It's too sad for that. A yoke of slavery. And there's no fun or freedom in walking around with a yoke strapped around your neck. You say, well, man, you're an oddity. You're a rebel. I've never seen a 70-year-old rebel before. Well, I'd rather be a rebel than a robot. Rebels think for themselves. Robots do what others tell them. Rebels act out of passion, robots, because they're programmed. What I don't understand is that we Americans, we uh, put such high value on freedom. We love, we love freedom. We send our young men and women into war to fight for it. We hear a patriotic song and tears well up in our eyes. America, land of the free. And yet when it comes to spiritual freedom, we give it up without a word of protest. Because we don't know we can have it and we're supposed to have it. We don't know it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. We don't know we are to stand firm in it and not allow ourselves to be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Jesus didn't rise from the grave so I could live in bondage to religion. He didn't ascend into heaven and pour out His Spirit and place that Spirit in me so that I could be enslaved by men or men's, man's many traditions. I... No, this message 
is not one you hear often, that doesn't mean it's not true. I want you to think about it. I want you to reflect upon it. Take your Bibles and open it to the book of Galatians. Learn how to be free. Learn you are free. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm. Now, maybe you're here today and you say, yeah, I've never known freedom. What I thought was freedom wasn't freedom at all. And maybe you have an inverted view of reality. Maybe you imagine that the Christian life is a life of deprivation and sacrifice. And maybe you see it as in a way that what will I have to give up? You've got it just backwards, my friend. Jesus said, I have come that you might have. I have come that you might have, that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. And maybe you are in bondage, the bondage of sin and darkness and separation from God and hopelessness. Why, Jesus can set you free too. In fact, Paul wastes no time in making that very clear. In the very first chapter of this book, Galatians in verse 4, he said, The Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. So the gospel good news is for you, my friend. Freedom is yours in Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today that you are a way maker and you made a way where there seemed to be no way. I thank you that you came to strip off the chains and to set us free and to bring us into the glorious freedom that Christ has provided for us. I pray that we'll be good receivers today, that we'll be the recipients of all that you have for us. That the freedom of Christ will supersede the bondage of religion, the bondage of expectations. Lead us into that glorious promised land of your freedom today. There may be saints here today that need that touch, Lord, that awareness, that liberation afresh and anew. And there may be those who have not yet become saints who have found themselves in a terrible and dark bondage in the grips of sin, and they need the freedom that only you can provide. I pray there will be a glorious emancipation in the life of saint and sinner today. In the name of Jesus, his solitary name we pray, his sovereign name, 